Hi, this is Ben Kaspit, Al Monitor's correspondent in Israel. Welcome to our first chapter of the brand new podcast on Israel, in which we will try to make a relative order in the Israeli chaos. And today, we made history in Jerusalem. So let's go. Hall number 317 on the third floor of uh, Jerusalem's district court has the honor five years ago of hosting Israel's former prime minister, Ehud Olmert, who stood and heard himself being convicted on various counts of corruption for which he had been tried. Olmert was sent to prison. Today, the same location played host to Olmert's here, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, the man who broke Ben-Gurion's immortal record for the longest term in office and is now entering history with the less flattering title of the first incumbent prime minister to be tried on three counts of indictment, cheating, bribery, and breach of trust. Netanyahu, it appears, inherited from Olmert not only the prime minister's office and the official residence of Balfour Street, but also the very same courtroom in which Olmert was tried. I was there today at the historic moment, more than four years after the investigation began against Netanyahu, The moment has finally arrived, the moment he had feared more than anything else. The moment he has been trying to evade using every trick in the book and few others that aren't written anywhere. The moment when an Israeli prime minister will chair a government session in the morning and spend the afternoon facing three judges. I was hoping that Netanyahu will internalize his position at the last moment and lower his eyes one way or another, before the Israeli judicial system. That hope has been proven wrong. In his efforts to escape from justice this morning, Netanyahu tried to drag half the Israeli public into the courtroom with him. He has no compunction about tearing the nation apart and placing one half in the defendant's dock with him. Almost 59 years ago, Jerusalem saw the opening of the trial of Nazi criminal Adolf Eichmann. The prosecutor at uh, that trial was Gidon Hausner, who opened with a speech that would go down in history. In this place in which I stand before you, judges of Israel, to prosecute Adolf Eichmann, I stand not alone. With me, at this moment in time, I am joined by six million prosecutors. Hausner, of course, was referring to the many millions of people murdered in the Holocaust of the Jews of Europe. Almost 60 years later, some of Netanyahu's supporters are using the same rhetoric. And Netanyahu does nothing to contradict them, make no attempt to reject out of hand this comparison, and does not try to dampen the already heated atmosphere. On the contrary, he is trying to split the public and turn the court and his trial into a political show trial, even when he is totally aware of the potentially fatal, if not irreversible, harm that this could cause the state of Israel. And it's this trial that is of special concern to so many Israelis on this historic and so sad day. Netanyahu's trial opens almost in parallel Uh, with the launch of his fifth government, the first government in which he is not the sole ruler, but shares the leadership with former military chief of staff Benny Gantz. Netanyahu hopes to make his stamp on Israel's history via the highly controversial annexation, applying Israeli sovereignty on all parts of the Israeli settlements in Judea and Sumeria. He has yet to work hard on this, vis-à-vis the skepticism of Gantz and Ashkenazi, the growing fears within Trump administration in Washington, and warnings from King Abdullah of Jordan, as well as threats from Mahmoud Abbas in Ramallah. At the same time, Netanyahu continues to to oversee Israel's war against the COVID-19 virus and Israel's efforts against Iran, especially with regards to its defeat in Syria. All these are resting on the shoulders of one man who this morning has also become an indicted criminal. Just before three o'clock, the thousands of people were filling the area opposite the district court on East Jerusalem's Salahuddin Street. 
They were there to protest against the legal system, the prosecution, the police, attorney general, and anyone else who dares raise a hand against their beloved leader. Dozens of media teams for, from around the globe are filling all the openings, clamoring to get what should be one of the most historic picture of the decade, the picture of Benjamin Netanyahu on the defendant's bench. Only the day after will the test of Netanyahu's trial be evident. Whether he is indicted, whether he comes out a Dreyfus or a common criminal, whether Israel can heal the wounds and move forward, will someone be wise enough to step on the brakes before all the red lines are crossed? I am not ashamed to admit that over the years I was unable to believe that a picture of a prime minister ruling a country with one hand and criminal proceedings with the other is a feasible in Israel of 2020. It does not appear logical, it is not right, it is not done, but it's legal. Netanyahu's genius lies in the way he planted this situation in the awareness of millions of Israelis. At least half of them view him as a latter-day Superman, capable of simultaneously managing several crises and countries. Netanyahu's test will be whether or not he will wake up in time to halt the ever-growing rift, the civil war that is gathering momentum behind the scenes, before it all gets out of hand. The answer to these questions will emerge over the next few months. Netanyahu arrived unusually early, surrounded by government ministers and Knesset members who came to demonstrate solidarity. He took his place at the bottom of the courthouse stairs in the style of Dreyfus. For a long time, Netanyahu fired a crude barrage of words at the police, the prosecution, and all those who, according to him, conspired against him to stitch him up. When he finished, he went up to the third floor in the courthouse to room 317, when order was restored. Now, he is no longer the accuser, but the accused. He is no longer the prosecutor, but the prosecuted. At 10 minutes past 3 o'clock, the judges entered, headed by President Rivka Friedman Feldman, and Netanyahu stood up. Three minutes later, the president turned to him. He straightened. She asked him if he had read and understood the indictment. He said he had. This was the moment when the new rules were written. The arena in which Netanyahu now found himself is not the one over which he rules. Fiery speeches, demonstrations of the support, and threats won't influence her. In this arena, Netanyahu is not the ruler, but the ruled. The time has gone for justice. We'll stop here for a brief commercial break, immediately after which we'll welcome the first guest on podcast on Israel, former Prime Minister of Israel, Ehud Olmert. If you are listening to this podcast, you obviously care about the Middle East, and if you do, you should probably be reading El Monitor. El Monitor is a global newsroom headquartered in Washington, D.C., with a network of over 160 contributors around the world. El Monitor offers first-class reporting and analysis from a range of perspectives and an approach that represents the highest journalistic standards, as well as an award-winning commitment to press freedom and independence. If you haven't done so already, visit us at elmonitor.com, check out our articles, and sign up for our free newsletters. There's a lot to choose from, including the Week in Review, an essay that offers unusual insights and forecasts into the region based upon El Monitor's outstanding reporting. And if you haven't done so, please subscribe to our El Monitor podcast on your favorite podcast platform, on Israel with Ben Caspit and on the Middle East with me, Andrew Parasoliti. Our guest today is not suited for a day like this. Former Prime Minister Ehud Olmert, Netanyahu's predecessor, one of the two Israeli Prime Ministers still with us, apart from Netanyahu. Olmert was there and got through what Netanyahu went through today. 
in exactly the same courtroom. He was tried for a number of crimes. He was acquitted on some, convicted for some after an appeal by the state. And now he's one of the most harshest Netanyahu's critics in Israel. Olmert is Israel's 12th prime minister, and before that, he was the mayor of the city of Jerusalem. He knows Netanyahu very well, and he was his political partner and his political adversary for many years. He is very familiar with Israel, Israeli society, and the Israeli judiciary system. Shalom, Mr. Olmer. Thank you very much for agreeing to be our guest, first guest on On Israel podcast. Thank you very much, Ben, and uh, I appreciate the introduction. I just want to make one, if I may, one small, but not a insignificant uh, correction. Uh, I was never in the same position as Netanyahu because I was never indicted as a prime minister. Uh, yes, of course. Long before, long before any indictment, the very initial stage of the investigation, I figured out that uh, I may find myself in a position where, as prime minister, I'm fighting against the uh, courts, the prosecutor general, the attorney general, the police, the investigators, and all of this. And while I thought that I was uh, completely uh, innocent, uh, I uh, figured out that uh, I'd better resign, which I did at a very early stage. So. Netanyahu is the first and the only prime minister, reigning prime minister. At the time that he is prime minister, he is uh, indicted and he's sitting in the court uh, room, uh, and, uh, which I uh, was not uh, subject to. And I have, a, I have a special question about this later on, uh, but yeah. uh, let us uh, start, Mr. Olmert, in, in the question, how would you define today an important day, a sad day, a dangerous day, a day of hope or the desperation? Well, I, I, it definitely is a sad day, you know. No one wants that the uh, most important person in the uh, country, the prime minister, uh, will be indicted, particularly because he was indicted, again, unlike me, he was in the, he's indicted only for uh, crimes that uh, allegedly, yes, uh, that were committed in his capacity as prime minister at a time that he was prime minister and for personal benefits uh, that, uh, that were very useful and beneficial to him. Uh, so definitely this is a, a sad day. No one uh, uh, dreamt of it, no one wanted it. Uh, at, at the same time, it was also a dangerous day. It, uh, it's a dangerous day because Unfortunately, uh, I think the Prime Minister chose to challenge the, uh, uh, the entire systems, the uh, police, and he was accusing the uh, former Inspector General of Police for committing crimes, uh, you know, in precisely the same way that he argues that he has been subject to. But yeah, that's what he said today against the former Inspector General who is, uh, uh, by the way, a right, known to be a right-wing person and a settler in the past and so on. So it was very, very, uh, uh, it was devastating and very depressing. Also, he was accusing the uh, prosecutor and the attorney general for, for uh, actually framing him. Uh, uh, now, every, everyone that is indicted is unhappy about it and can complain. Uh, but when you are prime minister and you stand in front of the cameras uh, surrounded by uh, uh, the most senior ministers in the cabinet in the entrance to the court and you accuse the attorney general, the police, the inspector general, all the law uh, enforcing agencies of framing you and uh, actually you try to intimidate the court uh, with a demonstration of hundreds of people that were brought in with uh, buses, I think that this is uh, a very, very uh, uncomfortable, to put it mildly. But at the same time, I think that it shows something about the strength of uh, uh, the uh, Israeli democracy. The fact is that, in spite of the fact that he is prime minister and an incumbent, yes, uh, uh, he is uh, still brought to court and uh, he has to uh, face 
the uh, prosecutors. And uh, I think that it shows that Israel is a strong democracy. And I hope that uh, all the efforts made in order to intimidate the prosecution or the court will uh, be unsuccessful. Do you really think it's a, it's a sign of strength? Because we can count our, uh, all the predecessors. We already had a, a president in jail, an ex-prime minister uh, yourself in jail, a minister of uh, treasury in jail, minister of inferior in jail, and many, many others. Is it strength or weakness? Is Israel a corrupt state? Oh, not at all. Listen, if you uh, just, uh, you, we are broadcasting, I think, amongst other places to America, uh, you uh, find out how many uh, speakers and senators and congressmen were forced to leave their position because of, you know, similar uh, situations. Uh, so Israel is not uh, the, uh, the only uh, country. And I, and I think that while, of course, Sometimes uh, there are failures. At the same time, the fact that the law uh, enforcing agencies are strong enough to be able to enforce the law is ultimately the show of strength. And I hope that uh, there will not be, uh, that this balance will not be changed by the some, somewhat extraordinary uh, and aggressive measures that the prime minister is taking now in order to save himself. Let's uh, talk some, uh, a, a, a little about emotions. You know Netanyahu for decades. You were very close to him uh, from time to time. What do you think went through his mind and stomach today when he stood downstairs on, uh, opposite the court hall and, and, and uh, with his very brutal speech against the system? And then a few minutes later, when he was standing up, when the judges came in and uh, you know looked at his judges and maybe understood that he is not the, the, the controller in, here in this room. Well, uh, again, I, you know, I hope you will forgive me if I'll say that I never really was close to him. I never considered myself a friend of his. And I wasn't, I must say quite uh, honestly, I think he's a very capable person. But uh, in some ways, but uh, he, I, I, I was never overly impressed uh, with him. I think that Netanyahu is first and foremost a communicator. I mean, he is an outstanding uh, communicator. He is actually an actor. I, I think he, he could do a great career in Broadway, uh, which he may have done uh, had he not uh, left America and returned back to Israel because he, he, he lived a very major part of his life, he lived in America he, he, until the age of uh, well over 30. Uh, although he served in the army in a very combat and prestigious unit, so that has to be uh, remembered and, and given to his credit. Uh, so I, I was never really close to him and uh, I was not very impressed with him. And I think that he is not a strong man. I'll tell you something. A strong man doesn't need to do what he did today. Only a man who is utterly, utterly threatened and uh, uh, frightened can stand up and, you know, say, I will, I will destroy you. You are, you are a thief. You are a criminal. You are a gangster. The head of police, the head of the prosecution he threatens the, uh, the uh, court, uh, having all his ministers coming to uh, embrace him from all sides. Uh, a strong man doesn't need it. A strong man can sh stand in front of the cameras, which he would have done, which he would have been forced to anyway because of his position, and say quietly and modestly and humbly, I'm innocent, I will prove it in court, because he will have to prove it in court if he's innocent. I don't know, by the way, if he's not, or if he is. We will see, we'll find out through the process. And I think that would have made a much greater impact on the, uh, his constituents. So uh, I, I think that his performance today was out of, of fear and weakness, not a show of strength. Yeah. I think that uh, therefore when he faced the, uh, 
they, uh, they, uh, the judges, when they uh, enter the court uh, room, I think that he felt very, very lonely. That's Only a lonely people. person need to bring in so many people to make him feel that he is not. After having said all that, how can you explain to me or to yourself or to, or to the public or to, to our uh, listeners that since uh, the second uh, campaign in September 19, to the, the, the last campaign on the merch, he gained strength. He's, he's very popular. Maybe it is uh, the peak of popularity ever with these uh, uh, charges in court. Man, I, I think uh, we have to put things in a, in, a, in a more realistic proportion. Number one, you know, uh, the Likud under Netanyahu never reached the heights of the Likud of Arik Sharon, of Yitzhak Shamir, and of Menachem Begin. I, I ran, by the way, against Netanyahu, and this was his greatest defeat ever. He got only 12 mandates at the time that he ran against me, and I won uh, 29. But uh, Arik Sharon, when he ran for elections, got 38 mandates, Shamir got 40 and 41, Begin 48. So at the first place, uh, Netanyahu never got as much support as uh, his predecessors in Likud. Number, I was the head of Kadima, not the head of Likud. Number two, uh, the, uh, the uh, gains of Netanyahu were the expense of his partners from the right-wing sections of the uh, political bodies. So while as Heli could, he got more mandates, but his partners lost their mandates. So the truth is that even at the third election in uh, March, his block wouldn't allow him to form a cabinet. We all know it. What happened is that the opposition or the other side that was uh, challenging him uh, appeared to have been very weak. I mean, the personalities, the leaders, were very weak and some defected. Uh, some members of Blue and White defected and of the Labour Party defected. And that's what allowed him to form and eventually the, the black and, uh, Blue and White joined in. But the outcome of the elections would not allow him to uh, form a coalition. Actually, what happened is that he ran three times in, in the last year from April 2019 to March 2020. And the three election campaigns, he didn't get enough support to allow him to form a coalition under normal circumstances. Had it not been for the uh, coronavirus, he would have never formed a coalition in the first place. So I think the coronavirus may have been a pandemic and caused uh, some turmoil and some uh, uh, discomfort in the country. But as far as Netanyahu is concerned, I think he thanks the virus every morning. Before Final question, Mr. Olmert, about the, the trial. Do you think that this trial will continue to the end until a ruling is given? Or can we expect a plea bargain somewhere down the line? I don't, I, I don't think that he is made to make a plea bargain. It's not upon him to decide anyway. He is not the decision maker. Uh, the decision makers in his family are his wife and his uh, elder child, and, and, and they dictate what's going on. So, and I think that they already discussed this uh, issue several times. That's what I heard from close sources. And uh, they made it clear that he will not, there can be a, a plea bargain only if he admits in, in, in uh, you know, in some of the uh, uh, articles of the indictment, and that will necessarily, necessarily disqualify him for any public position forever, and also it will have to include a certain period of a jail period. So I don't think that he will go for a plea bargain. And I, I don't know to say, you know, one goes for a plea bargain only if he feels absolutely convinced that he's going to be convicted. And I think that in his state of mind, the way he's built and the, and, the, and the atmosphere around him is such that it's not likely that uh, he feels 
that he should he, he feels that he will uh, uh, win the case in court. And who knows? I don't know. I'm not familiar with the details to the extent that I can pass a judgment about the chances uh, what will happen in the uh, court process. Although I think that it is, it looks to me that you know when all was said and done the chances that he will be convicted are, are much higher than that he will be uh, acquitted. Can you imagine him going to jail? I can imagine him going to jail, why not? If he will be indicted, you know, uh, based on, on the past of Israel, you're talking to someone that has experienced it. Uh, Mr. Olmert, is it all possible By the to- way, there is one thing which is entirely different from what uh, I had to face with him. All the, all the allegations against me on the first place, and then my indictment, and then my conviction related to a period years and years and years before I became prime minister and nothing to do with my performance as prime minister. My performance as prime minister, which was investigated entirely from top to bottom, 10 times, 20 times, was found completely clear of any wrongdoing. Uh, everything that he's indicted for is something that he has committed using the powers of a prime ministership for his own personal benefit. All right, I'm moving to politics. Uh, yeah. And I want to ask you if you, you, if you believe that the Gantz and Netanyahu government will complete its term and remain in office for three or may, maybe more years. And if not, how is it going to end this romance? There, it will collapse. Don't ask me now exactly what will be the circumstances. I don't know. You know, it, uh, it depends. In, in most of the political crises that I've been through, in uh, more than 36 years in the center stage of Israeli politics, at the end, the crisis that brought down the government and which forced uh, early elections was always something that was unexpected uh, and which was un un unanticipated. So I'm, I'm not in a position to say now what exactly will cause it. That it may be something that will one of the minor ministers will do which will touch in a very sensitive nerve that will shake the stability of the government, will cause its collapse. I, I don't know, but I, I feel, based on my experience in the Israeli politics, I don't think there is anyone that has been through uh, for so many years as I did. I served nine times, I was uh, elected nine times to the Knesset, and uh, in addition to be uh, two, two terms mayor of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, I, I know, I feel that it will, it will collapse much earlier than, uh, than most people think. But, but you know, this uh, coalition agreement is unique. We never saw something like this with two prime ministers and they already voted to everything. They even swore in Benny Gantz to his term as prime minister in, on November 2021. So it's like an automatic pilot. If, if Netanyahu will pull us to election, Benny Gantz is becoming automatically prime minister. Yeah, but so what? Uh, you know, this is what uh, I think Gantz could have accomplished uh, had he not uh, surrendered at the very last minute. He could have created it uh, had he had a little bit more stamina and a little bit more experience, which unfortunately he doesn't. But uh, look, they, 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 this combination of 16 members of Knesset having 16 ministerial positions against a block of 59, which has the same number of ministers. I mean, this is absolutely crazy. This is absolutely insane. And I don't think that it will last. I don't think that it will work. At the end, something will happen. And as I said before, I wish I could tell you what will be the circumstances. I don't know. No, but it will, not, it will not stay. It will not prevail. The most in intriguing question today uh, to ask Mr. Olmert is this. According to the coalition agreement on July 1st, Netanyahu can present a proposal to annex the Jewish settlement in Judea and Somalia and the Jordan Valley. In your position, in your opinion, will he do this? Will he do this? Number one, I think that if he will try to do it, and if he will 
succeed, which I doubt very much, it will be a disaster to Israel. Already the intention to do it is, is a, a major stumbling block for the state of Israel, not, not for, uh, for the uh, government only, for the state. Uh, uh, I think that America uh, will not agree. I, I think that uh, uh, the uh, statement that was made by Joe Biden, uh, who is, you know, has, uh, is having his chances of being president. I don't know if he will be elected. I don't want to go into American politics. I'm not sure that I know enough at the present time to be able to pass an uh, observation about what the chances are for the president or Joe Biden. But the fact that the Democratic Party will uh, be in, completely against it, all of Europe will be completely against it. Jordan already threatened that it will uh, uh, actually uh, maybe uh, will, will uh, uh, depart from the peace agreement and Egypt may follow up. Uh, it can cause, and the most important thing, the one which I think is very important for the friends of Israel that may listen to us to understand, there is not, I consider myself to be uh, uh, you know, uh, quite familiar with all the needs of Israel's security and uh, being a former prime minister and being involved with every aspect of our security and security needs and threats and, and difficulties, but there is not one single expert, one single former G general chief of staff or uh, head of uh, secret service, head of Mossad, anyone that uh, do not share this uh, observation of mine that that making a unilateral annexation of any part of the West Bank, the settlements or the uh, Jordan Valley, will be a disaster for Israel and for Israel's security. And therefore, I hope that it, it, it will be prevented. And I think that Netanyahu is, uh, is uh, you know, is a big talker, you know, but uh, according to Netanyahu, he would have uh, uh, destroyed Iran almost 10 years ago which he didn't, of course. And uh, uh, in the same time, Iran penetrated Syria and he doesn't have the guts or the, uh, or the concept or the plan of how to get rid of them in Syria. He threatened the annihilation of Hamas in Gaza, which he never did, never tried to do seriously. So I think there is much Edo, and I hope about very little. I hope. Uh, I, I want to go back, uh, finally, to the situation, the current situation, and I to ask you, is it at all possible to lead a country like Israel at the same time as handling a criminal trial? You did both things, but not at the same time. You say, if I did? No. No, is it possible I, I, to do right now? He's the, the sitting prime minister, and he is accused in... in, in no the way he is... The way he's handling himself now, it can be done because he has created the most bizarre government that there is in the world, where a coalition of, uh, on a parity basis of 16 members against 59, with an uh, uh, alternate prime minister that has been sworn in at the same time that he was sworn in, only because the alternate prime minister doesn't believe a word of him and he thinks that only in this way he may have guaranteed the uh, fulfillment of uh, Netanyahu's commitment. So uh, I think that uh, uh, to run a government, I, you know, I, I couldn't agree, I couldn't understand, you know, I mean, this is beyond comprehension. I, I understand that uh, they had to make, they wanted to make a parity government because otherwise 16 members uh, against 59 is, is uh, you know, is ridiculous for, for the 16 members to uh, give Netanyahu the uh, position of prime minister that he wouldn't uh, obtain otherwise, uh, only in order to become a junior partner, wouldn't be reasonable, particularly against the background of their accusations against him and the very bitter political campaigns that they ran against him. So, uh, but why couldn't they make it parity on the basis of, say, 18 ministers? They have 34 ministers, 16 deputy ministers. This is not only the largest government in the history of the state of Israel, the largest cabinet, but I'll tell you something. A cabinet is an executive body. I know, I, I ran a government 
I was in charge of the government. I, I, I had a, a cabinet. It's an executive body. No way that you can operate a body of 34 ministers and, uh, or maybe 36 at the end and 16 deputy minister as an executive effective working body. It's impossible. So uh, it is possible only as a framework for his uh, continued position as prime minister in order to help him. So he hopes in his court case, uh, nothing else. But uh, I don't have any expectations that this government will do anything of substance and of significance that will make a difference in the quality of life of Israel, in, in, in the social life, in the econo economic life, or in the security. And quite frankly, I think that there is a major uh, a major economic crisis now because of the uh, coronavirus and the fact that there are 26.7% unemployment is something that will come to haunt Netanyahu uh, much earlier than he thinks and will probably will be, the, be directly or indirectly the cause of the collapse of his government. So my last question is, you've mentioned yeah. several times uh, recently that the Netanyahu age or era is over. Do you still think so? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. They are, unfortunately, this process is much slower than sh it should be, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's inevitable. He is done. He is done. The equ only question is how, how, what will be the price that we pay before he's gone? But he's done. There's no doubt about it. Prime Minister El Dolmer, I want to thank you very much for agreeing to be the first ever guest of On Israel, Al Monitor's brand new podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. All the best to you. And we are breaking to a short commercial break. We'll be uh, back soon with some closing thoughts. If you're listening to this podcast, you obviously care about the Middle East. And if you do, you should probably be reading El Monitor. El Monitor is a global newsroom headquartered in Washington, D.C., with a network of over 160 contributors around the world. El Monitor offers first-class reporting and analysis from a range of perspectives and an approach that represents the highest journalistic standards, as well as an award-winning commitment to press freedom and independence. If you haven't done so already, visit us at elmonitor.com, check out our articles, and sign up for our free newsletters. There's a lot to choose from, including the Week in Review, an essay that offers unusual insights and forecasts into the region based upon El Monitor's outstanding reporting. And if you haven't done so, please subscribe to our El Monitor podcast on your favorite podcast platform, On Israel with Ben Caspit and On the Middle East with me. Andrew Parasoliti. So it was another day in the chaotic chronicles of the democracy that is the state of Israel. Benjamin Netanyahu broke the record of the state's founder, David Ben-Gurion, for the length of time in office, has now become the first prime minister to stand trial while still on the job. Israeli society has never been so divided and disconnected. These are not the ordinary tribes that we know on the political right and left, religious and secular, and all that jazz. Israel is now divided into pro-Bibi and anti-Bibi, torn apart into two bleeding rags, hoping for some kind of miracle that will allow it to move forward, to heal the wounds, and to get out of this crisis and somehow get back on its feet. Thank you for listening, and we'll meet again next week in the second installment of On Israel, Al Monitor's new podcast. That's all for now. Take care.